It's so great to see y'all. For those of you joining us on YouTube, thank you for being here. And uh, it's, it's tricky because part of feeling really connected to people is to be able to see your whole face. And we have a masked audience, except for little eyes. And I appreciate the eye contact, so um, welcome. And my name is Cal, and this is our first Become Forum. And uh, I just wanted to talk for a minute about uh, how I was inspired to do such a thing. Um, I don't know if you all have ever heard of uh, Gabor Mate. He is a, a guru when it comes to trauma. He's out in uh, Vancouver, he's an MD, he's pretty famous. Um, but he recently had a movie called The Wisdom of Trauma. And uh, he had a big forum of people talking about how trauma and humans going through trauma really is the underpinning of most of the maladies that humans face, whether it's mental health issues, addiction issues, and even physical health. And how his goal is, he said, he's 77 years old, and he said, people will understand it, just not in my lifetime. And I was like, I want to help, Gabor, I want to help. So um, I'm in private practice, many of you know, uh, and I, I feel, uh, I don't know, bad when people, I, I feel grateful that people reach out to want to uh, get help and trauma therapy in particular. And the part of me that feels bad is that I'm full. I, I just um, don't have room for more people right now. So I have a wait list and I just feel this overwhelmed and sad because I know how much it takes to finally get to the point where you ask for help and then to be told, well, I'm sorry, I can't help you, or you gotta get on the list, and it might be months and months and months. So part of what I wanted to do with this is in the meantime, until somebody either can see me or they're on somebody else's wait list, um, is that I can at least give some of the info, which we're gonna share with you tonight, skills, concepts, other people's experiences, um, so even if you're not in with a therapist yet or getting the help you need, at least you'll know uh, that trauma is real and the things that you're experiencing, there's so often there's a trauma reason for it and that, that we're not alone. So um, welcome, you guys. Please grab a chair and uh, we can just keep on going back. Uh, please sit down and... and um, welcome. So at any time, if you feel that, because we're going to talk about some pretty emotional things, uh, if any time you just need to, please listen to your own nervous system. If you need to get up, the bathrooms are right back there. Go back to the other part of the building. There's snacks, there's water. Go on outside. Um, our, these ladies here and Tina over here. If you need somebody to kind of be present with you, please let them know. Uh, we just want you to feel safe and connected and just that, that you belong here because you totally do. So um, that's the reason why we're here. We want to give you some education. We want to teach some skills. We want to share some stories. And now I'd like the, the team to come on up and um, introduce yourselves. So we'll start with you, Tina. Hi, I'm Tina. Um, I started my work in this field in 2000, um, and it was something that I started because mental health meant something very important to me. Um, I have, you know, some family members who have experienced. Um, their own problems and and I wanted to try to help and understand in a whole different way so that's how I started and um, I was working in an outpatient clinic I, I say a hundred years ago that's kind of 
uh, how I describe things. But I, I think it was 2003, maybe, and that's where I met Cal. Cal was my my mentor, you know, and she really kind of opened my eyes to the world of dual diagnosis and folks who struggled with both mental health and substance abuse issues. So. Um, yeah, so that's where I started, and then I went back to school uh, to get my social work degree, so I could actually have my license and then be able to practice in mental health. Um, and throughout the time, you know, that I was doing that, Cal was, you know, working beside me and started her own private practice, and, you know, together we, we were very interested in trauma, you know, something that she had, she had mentioned um, before, and, you know, really sparked an interest. I was very lucky to be able to see Gabor Mate actually speak in Geneva. I think it may have been 2011 or 2012. So that was really cool to be able to to, to have that, knowing that that was you know part of her inspiration. So um, after I graduated from graduate school with my MSW, I did go and get trained in EMDR. <laughs> so I'm working full time in a clinic right now. Just started my private practice, and I'm hoping to be able to help folks with their trauma. If, if you know EMDR is something that I can be helpful with those folks, I would like to do so. So that's why I'm here and part of the forum. Thank you. Thanks, Tina. Hi, everyone. My name is Maddie, and I am a junior social work major at Nazareth College. Um, through my own experiences throughout my life and through seeing everything Cal has done with her private practice, I have been inspired to pursue social work. So when she invited me to be a part of this forum, I was very excited for the opportunity to learn and help other people. Hi, I am Kenzie. I am also a junior and I go to Keuka College. And I was inspired to join the forum because I am surrounded by social workers and I really like the change that you can make, whether it's small, large, change is change. And I just feel like this forum is an excellent opportunity for me to create that change. Thank you. And I, I do want to say that this idea came to fruition less than two months ago and we've been meeting regularly he's and and this is she doesn't want me to introduce but our tech person uh producer back there is lindsay Meaton, and uh, she's my daughter and she's also an intern um well there, I, I consider all three of you guys interns the the social workers and lindsay's a media communications major um but all three of these women young women uh are busy at, at school they're finals just got done and on Saturdays we've been meeting and brainstorming and and Tina and I working full-time so we've just been really devoted and I so appreciate your devotion and your help because we never would be having this uh, I couldn't do it alone without the support of these guys and it sure didn't take long for us the like the first 15 minutes what's our mission statement well good thing I wrote it down so um, here is the mission statement of this Become Forum. And this is our first night, and the topic tonight is about suicide. We can do this like every six weeks or, or monthly, bi-monthly, we'll see whether we wanna continue on this topic or we wanna talk about EMDR, which Tina brought up. We're gonna talk about that more tonight. Uh, other mental health related issues, please let us know and um, we can do this again. So our mission statement is we recognize there's a lack of mental health services and support. Our mission is to create a safe space to teach skills, concepts, reduce stigma, and help everyone become a part of their own and community healing. And become just kind of, whoop, there it was. We, our acronym, it stands for belonging, education, community, outreach, mental health and emotional wellness or well-being so it just gelled because it's it's necessary and we're really trying to reduce stigma around mental health issues and addiction issues 
and, and increase the awareness and sensitivity that trauma is real and there's reasons why we're having the disturbances that we are. Um, when you slow down and look at where you've been in some of your experiences, then it starts to make sense. It's also timely because holidays are upon us, and you know that's notoriously a time where. Um, uh, okay, I'm going to hold still, so I'm going to take my mask off for a minute so I can breathe too. Um, it's a time when, uh, if there's any kind of grief or trauma, missing people or um, different traditions or or whatever it is, uh, the holidays can often exacerbate it and make us feel more alone. And um, that, that's another kind of cool thing that it just so happened, we didn't plan this, that it was gonna be around the holidays, but if anybody needs support and knowing you're not alone because of this time of year, well, here we are. And um, there is, what I wanna talk about is uh, a difference between trauma and grief. Um, when we go through trauma, it, unless we have a chance to fully process it, it kind of locks up in the neural network of our brains. And we keep, our, our human minds keep wanting to resolve it. And ways that you know you're trying to resolve it are, okay, maybe I'm having recurrent dreams about it, or I'm having like images of it, or recurrent negative thoughts about myself so that's how we know we're, we're trying to get through it, but it, it just kind of locks up. The process that Tina and I are trained in of EMDR allows the neural network to un get stuck, to, to go uh, process. And then when we do that, the more positive beliefs come through and then we could grieve more naturally. When they're locked up together, trauma and grief, it's really hard to grieve fully because the trauma is kind of in the way. So just wanted to, to help you guys be aware of that. Um, so a couple of the concepts that I teach people when they start to work with me, I want to teach you now because these are concepts that once you learn them, you can you don't need a therapist. <laughs> you know, it, you can regulate. You can learn more how to regulate yourself. So this model um, is called the vagus nerve ladder model, and Deb Dana is um, a social worker as well. Um, that created this. She and Stephen Porges worked together on this. He's a very famous guru kind of guy that uh, helped us social workers understand more of the neuroscience and how the nervous system really affects our emotions and our behaviors. So I love this model because it normalizes our system. So all of us are humans. All of us have a nervous system that is meant to, to help us survive. And everybody knows fight flight. That's the sympathetic nervous system. So like if a, a bear were to pop through, we'd all, we wouldn't even have to think about it, right? Everybody would, we would activate, we would become mobilized. That's the sympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic or also called dorsal vagal, is also a survival mechanism, um, but it's not mobilized. It's the freeze and fawn or freeze and submission. So oftentimes people uh, that I, I'll work with that are adults and maybe looking back on something traumatic that happened to them when they were a child and they're so mad at themselves. Like, why didn't I run? Why didn't I fight? 
Well, the wisdom of their own nervous system knew, where are you going? Like if this is an adult that's supposed to keep you safe, you can't run away and you can't fight because this adult is gonna overpower you. So automatically your autonomic nervous system opted to do freeze or submission and it kept the child safe. It is survival. But as they become adults, then they feel guilt and shame because why didn't I fight? And, and what the work is, is helping them to understand, honey, <laughs> your nervous system did exactly what it needed to do. It kept you alive. So um, that's the, the survival mechanism. And then at the top of the ladder here, ventral vagal, that's where we're safe, we're connected. Maybe we're not as happy as this cute little guy, but, but we're okay. Like, we, we know we belong in the world. Um, and on the daily, all of us, and even not in the daily, uh, uh, give, it, give it 10 minutes, <laughs> we can be going up and down the ladder. And the goal is to be able to go up and down the ladder and not get hijacked in certain areas. And, and that's what I love about it because it's so normalizing because if we're very anxious and there's no bear, well, that, that's anxiety, but we can, if we look at it this way, we can say, well, okay, am I safe? And why am I acting like there's a bear and there isn't? And it kind of gives you hope, well, I, I want to come home to, to ventral vagal. Deb Dana calls it coming home to ventral vagal. So for each of these, here's a little other thing to know. I learned this through my somatic experiencing training. For sympathetic and parasympathetic, there's low and high tone. Low tone means I'm excited or I'm a little nervous, but I'm still connected. High tone is, oh no, I'm not connected at all. We gotta go, like it's not safe at all. We're not gonna be connected, we have to go. Um, same down here, low tone dorsal vagal, rest, digest, I'm still okay. High tone dorsal vagal is uh, depression, shut down, avoid, dissociate. And the topic tonight, ultimate, dorsal vagal is really prepared to die. So this is the part that I, I really find important and I hope those of you that have worked with me, it's not new information, but maybe those of you that, that haven't, this might be the newer information, that suicide in, in many cases is actually the nervous system's attempt to keep the system safe. <laughs> even though it's misguided, because there's, there's so much pain or anxiety or depression, the system thinks, I'm out. Like, it's like a little escape hatch. We are escaping this pain, whether it's physical or emotional, but it's, it's intense, and, and it's a mechanism to get out. Obviously, it's a misguided mechanism because then the whole system will be gone, and, and we don't want that. But I, again, I like having this normalizing concept because if you think about animals, I always think about animals, love animals, they show this so well in their, in their bodies. So um, let's say a gazelle is flighting. It, it, the, here comes a lion, it's, it's running. So it's doing sympathetic and it's trying to run away. The lion gets it. Now it's fighting, it, it, you know, its little hoofs are gone, it's trying to fight. Well, the lion overpowers it, no way. So it, it actually goes into dorsal vagal, it releases natural opiates from the brain that calm it down and help it prepare to die. So that's how it's a survival mechanism. Um, does that make sense, you guys, you with me? You know, I'm long. Thank you. So that's a, a relatively brief explanation of how our, our nervous systems um, are, we all have them and there are a way to stay safe and 
sometimes in their attempts to keep us safe, they're not exactly helping us out anymore. But if we can, like the skill would be to notice in your own body, well, what am I, oh, I just dropped for some reason. Like, wow, I'm, I'm just feeling so low all of a sudden. And with curiosity, what's going on? Like, maybe I'm tired, maybe I'm kind of hungry, or maybe there was a trigger right there. And I didn't even know that there was a trigger where I just kind of want to check out. And that's part of the, the work we do, like in EMDR therapy, we kind of understand where this this drop might be. Um, so how many people here have ever heard of internal family systems or IFS? Show of hands. Good. I talk about a lot on my YouTube channel. Um, so I would like my, I got a mask up, so I'm gonna ask my team to come up, please. All right, so um, internal family systems was developed by uh, Richard Swartz, where he's looking, he's organized a way for us to understand all the different parts of ourselves. And again, I love it because it's so normalizing. We all have parts, and they're all there for certain reasons. And they, they live in the, the nervous system as well. It all kind of goes together. You'll, you'll understand that in a little bit. So his concept is uh, we are all born with like this soul, our spirit, like that, that heart, like just that, the, the, your spirit, for lack of a better word. And um, this actually came um, Amanda painted this. She's not here tonight. She's an artist. This is actually a depiction of self. Self is where we feel calm, clear, curious, confident, courageous, creative, compassionate, and connected. And all of those qualities are where we're ventral vagal. Where we just know that, that it's okay. And, and when we know that we're safe and not under threat, then we can be creative. Then we have the space to be compassionate. It frees us up because all this stuff isn't going on. It's not realistic to think we're going to be like that all the time. None of us are. But it's there. It's always there. Okay, that's the, the baseline. Then we're all born with all these little parts. And they, they move around. They shift. They're formed in different ways. And uh, Schwartz has organized them in the three categories. <clears throat> and Lindsay's also a, an artist, and, and she drew these. So the first category are the exile parts. So can everybody see a little exile? And then the next layer are manager parts. and then firefighter parts. So again, you know what? I forgot to say my little disclaimer, so I'll say it now. Um, this is not a therapy group, and we, we want to create a safe, connected space. But disclaimer, we are live on YouTube, so it is public. So keeping in mind that, that you know, I'm going to be describing what these parts do, and we're going to be doing some interviewing, uh, uh, little interviews in a couple minutes, but um, just keep in mind that this is not confidential. It, it is public, so if anybody shares anything, just keep that in mind. As much as we want to reduce stigma, and there is stigma and judgment still, so just keeping that in mind. Um, so anyway, all of us have exile parts, and exiles are often younger parts of us. They, they might be little kid parts of us. We can have many different exiles. We, we have little three-year-old parts. We might have a 12-year-old part. But exiles are the parts that are holding the traumatic story 
from way back. They're, they're carrying unhealed, unprocessed memories, and they're carrying uh, the painful emotions. So exiles are really carrying the pain. And often they're little kids, like I said. If we have a safe, kind, grown up with us, if something bad happens when we're little, and that person takes us away from the danger and makes sure we're safe and validates how we're feeling and tells us, oh my gosh, honey, that was so not your fault. And I'm never going to let you go through that again. And come on, I got you. If that happens, chances are that's not going to stick in there as a trauma so much. It's going to be a crappy memory probably, but it's not going to get locked in like and form these negative cognitions about themselves like the exiles have, meaning this is my fault or I'm not safe. When we don't have a chance to do that for whatever reason, if the parent was mentally ill themselves or um, just domestic violence where they couldn't or, or whatever, when the child isn't kept safe and it, things are ongoing, that's even worse. That's where the poor little exile is like locked. That's why it kind of looks like a jail. Well, the rest of the system, the rest of the whole system, does not like the fact that there's this emotion and these traumatic stories going on. So the rest of the system exiles this little part. And then we have manager. So managers are parts that, that you can see here, they, they're trying to protect the, the little exile. And they do things like control what comes in and out of the system. They might be worried about how we appear to everybody. Uh, we want to make sure we don't make any mistakes. <laughs> you know, we don't want to screw up. We, we got to keep it locked down because something bad could happen to the exile again. And we can't really trust people. We can't be vulnerable because bad things happen. So that's a manager. Then if something dangerous slips past manager, meaning some kind of traumatic incident or a reminder of the traumatic incident or feelings that come a little too intense, then firefighter parts come on the scene. And firefighters are going to do anything that will protect this little exile. And firefighter can, can be in both of these nervous systems. So firefighter can fight and flight, and they can also take us right out. They can calm things down with substances, they can calm things down with dissociation. They can calm things down with self-injury. And then they ultimately, they, they can hurt others and they can just take the whole system out because again, they think they're helping the exile because it's just too much. It's, the system becomes overwhelmed in this model. Um, so when we're talking about suicide tonight, we are literally talking about firefighter parts. And when um, we decided we were, we were in our meeting phases, all of a sudden I got a free training come up from PESI, who is a pretty big training company for mental health things, issues. And they had a free training um, called Rethinking Suicide. And they had some pretty good concepts. Tina's going to talk a little bit about that later tonight. Um, but one of the things the, the guy said, Craig, whoever, yeah. What's his name, Craig Bryan? Craig Bryan, yeah. Um, is that we often see suicide as something that's in stages, or there's an assumption it's because somebody is severely depressed, or it's, it's only for people with a long history of mental illness. And while in some cases that's true, but lots of times it's, that's not true at all. It can be a very impulsive thing, or it could be something in response, something that, 
that just blows everybody out of the, the, all the parts and the firefighter just like boom shows right up. So this topic of suicide is very complex and there's no easy answer and, and again we don't have the answers but we want to give the opportunity for different concepts for different awarenesses and we're even going to be talking about people's experience what was helpful and what was totally not helpful so that that's um a little intro to the parts and uh, thanks so you guys can have a seat and uh, So now what I'd like to do is pretty soon we're going to um, have a guest come on up. But before we do that, I want to teach a, uh, an exercise. So if you are aware of your nervous system and you're feeling a little nervous. So show of hands, is, is anybody feeling a little sympathetic nervous system right now? Anybody admit it? You guys nervous? You good now? Yeah. You? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, so they have, there's some nerves going on. Yeah. Well, me too. So, here's a skill. So let's. Okay. Isn't that nice? Can you see me now, Lindsay? So, a way to change the state of our nervous system because I, I forgot to mention because I'm all giving you all this info. The vagus nerve goes from the base of our brain all the way down our spinal cord, and vagus means traveler. So the vagus nerve travels around our respiratory system, it travels around our di digestive system, which makes total sense, right? Because when we need to run away, we need, we need oxygen, we need blood, like digestion, who cares about that? We're running, you know. Um, so, and when we're very shut down, we need to come on line. So it's a regulatory thing. One of the things we can do to change that state is literally to turn our head. So I would like everybody in here, I'll explain it first and kind of show you, and then I'd like y'all to, to do it with me. So what we do is you, you just simply turn your head slowly and gaze so I'd like before you do it kind of take a little internal curious scan through through your system I did this because I must be feeling right here so where do you feel spend just a moment and, and with curiosity go inside for just a second and no, I just, I heard you exhale, Tina, and me too. We just slow the roll a little bit. And do you feel a tension in your head? Do you feel it in your chest or your stomach? Where are you feeling it? And then very gently turn your head, gaze around, look at the cute little flower on the wall, whatever you notice. When you're doing this kind of thing, it's nice to be mindful, being aware of the temperature that you feel on your skin, any sense that you might smell, what you're hearing, what you're looking at. So what we're doing is we're going from tunnel vision, maybe locked in a certain part of the nervous system, and we're coming more present into the moment and also back into our bodies too like what am i what am i noticing so with suicide there's often this tunnel vision it's like this i can never get out of this situation nothing's ever going to change the perspective goes way narrow and what we're trying to do is help the system come out of that tunnel vision and I, I love to say, don't quit before the miracle happens, because you guys, we don't know. Like, tomorrow could be the best day of your life, you know, and we can look forward to things. So that's just a little skill. 
Very simple, right? You, you don't need a therapist to do that skill. Um, and what I do like to do now is uh, bring our first guest up. said this is a very complex issue <laughs> suicide and uh, everybody in here has your own experience and your own reason for being here and if you feel comfortable raising your hand if not you don't have to but this part of our time together we're going to be coming from the perspective of if you have lost someone to suicide uh, that, that you care about or even if you're really worried that, that you could lose someone to suicide. So those of us that have ever lost anybody to suicide, you can raise your hand if you want. Yeah. So if, I don't want us to just like fly right into the trauma without being able to come back out. So again, like I said, if, if you can get up, you can walk around. Don't forget the, the looking around if you don't want to get up. We just we go at our own pace. So um, I, I want to introduce Stacy. Stacy and I uh, have worked together on and off for a few years. And um, I'm just so thankful that, that you're willing to, to come here and share about your experience, Stacy. So thank you. And um, would you like to share with, with our group, um, why you're here, like what the situation is that caused you to be here tonight. Hello, bear with me. I'm not used to speaking. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Can I take it off? Or sure. We're sit yeah, we're sitting. So we're good. <laughs> As she said, my name is Stacy. Um, my mother took her own life June 25th of 93. Um, it'll be 28 and a half years on Christmas Day. Um, it's been a tough 28 years. Um, you know, I tried everything possible to deal with it. Um, I was 21 at the time, she was 38, so I was still young. Thank God I was the legal drinking age <clears throat> because I um, unfortunately drank a lot after that. I didn't, I went to counselors, I went to support groups, um, I did everything that everybody told me to do, you know, write stuff down. Um, find music, you know, talk to people. I did, but nothing, I, nothing would help because the only way that I could deal with stuff is to, you know, if my mother was there, I could talk to her and yell at her or whatever, let her know that I was pissed off. But I couldn't do that because that person was gone. So how do you, how, how do you go on from that? So um, unfortunately I did take up drinking. I wasn't an alcoholic, but I did drink a lot. That's how I numbed myself. Um, and then I uh, became a funeral director, so I dealt with that and my job as well. Hence why I found this lovely lady. Um, I had had kind of a traumatic experience um, being on call one night, um, and my doctor told me, you know, you should really look into this uh, project, EMDR. E EMDR. Um, so I found Cal and amazing. I mean, she's so down to earth. You know, she's like one of my friends. She'll text me pictures of animals on, you know, Friday night at 8 o'clock. I'm like, who does that? So she helped me work through that. And, you know, I had no idea what this stuff was and how it would actually help or anything like that. But it's amazing to just give something like that a chance and, um, you know, yeah, I still get anxious sometimes, like, if I'm talking to somebody that's had a recent loss or whatever, it's like I immediately feel like I need to help them, you know, I need to reach out, here's my cell number, call me, whatever, um, just because I feel like 
you know, having 28 years of experience going through this, I, I can be of benefit to somebody, somehow, um, even if it's just a listen. But um, her walking me through that process was was amazing, and if you've never done it, I, I would recommend just giving it a try. I mean, what do you have to lose? Um, that's it in a nutshell. I don't know if you have questions. Yeah, so um, you mentioned EMDR, and I, I guess maybe what would be helpful without getting into all the ins and outs of the EMDR therapy, which we would like to do one of these on just strictly EMDR. That, that's for another time. Um, but it is a researched, uh, re well-researched, proven uh, type of therapy for helping people heal from trauma. And it's also really helpful with I found a lot of different issues with the nervous system, whether anxiety or, or depression, but it's primarily started with trauma. Um, so I guess let's kind of pinpoint the, the acute, like the, the real problematic things that you experienced, like in your day-to-day -day or trying to do your job, like meaning like images that wouldn't go away or, or stuff that really got in your way and how just talking about it never seemed to help. So let, let's just answer that question, okay. So you mean from like the beginning? Yeah, you're not talking about MDR, like when you came, what were you experiencing? Um, it, for the most part, I was okay. It was just that one incident where I was asked to, you want me to go into that detail about doing the removal or? No, probably not. But like, it, 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 what did it do to your nervous system? Oh. Because you were trying to do your job, right? right. And, and your nervous system, how did it react? Yeah, um, not to go into details, but it was on the weekends and the 911 center called and um, had asked me to do a removal and I always asked why and they had said it was a suicide and I said, okay, um, my mother committed suicide, so can you tell me how? So when they said how this person had done it, it was the same way that my mother had done it. And I just like started hyperventilating, like blacked out. And mind you, I dealt with suicides in, in this business before, so it wasn't my first time, but I didn't have my boss with me. I didn't have anybody else with me. And this would be the first time that I would have been dealing with that same type of thing. And I just, I, I, the, the dispatcher's like, don't worry about it, you know, just, and I literally hung up the phone and I had to call my cousin and I was like, just like bawling and it's like, you know, this was 27 years I've been dealing with this, so I totally did not expect that reaction, so, um, and it, it, I was like shaking for a while, like, I, I went to work and my boss was like, uh, are you okay, and I mean, I ended up dealing with this gentleman afterwards, um, which was okay, I just didn't have to go to the scene, that was like, but that just, it, it put me in such a, a bad place. I mean, I, and I'm actually working with that dispatcher now, but um, I, I told her, I said, I honest, I would have to listen to the tape because I blacked out. I really don't know exactly how that all went or, or you know, what was said or anything like that. So it was just, threw me for a big loop. Yeah, yeah and it, it threw Stacy's nervous system for a big loop. So even before we did EMDR, well, EMDR therapy stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, and there's a bilateral component, whether it's eyes or tapping, or now that we do telehealth, I have people tapping their own shoulders, which is just as effective. Um, but part of EMDR is what we're doing tonight. It's giving you, I call it front loading. So we're learning concepts and skills by your own nervous system and, and what could be happening so you can understand better. So it's not just the panic running the show. Um, so another clue that it's trauma getting activated is when you notice you're having a hundred dollar reaction to a five cent problem. That's like, okay, I'm overreacting here. There's something, there's a reason. It's not just because I'm cray cray right now. It, no, there's a reason. So in terms of the, the nervous system, like how Stacy just just described it, right? She she's normally ventral vagal, like maybe a little sympathetic ventral vagal. Okay, I'm 
I'm mobilized, I, I'm at work, like I know I'm okay, I'm a professional, I know what I'm doing, I got this, and then bam, there's, there's the, the trauma. Now she's not ventral vagal anymore at all. She's fight flight, panicky, out of her window of tolerance, and then, did, I don't know if you noticed in terms of nervous system, when she said, I don't even remember, I blacked out. That's down here. So we boing, 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 boing. We're, we're bouncing back and, and forth. So that's like, it, it was just overwhelmed your nervous system so much, I can't even remember it. That, that just like, nope, wasn't online. And that's the nervous system activated exile, uh, uh, not a little kid exile, a 21-year-old exile. The, I hate to, to say this word, but it, 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 it's the horror of it. And, and I know, too, because I've lost a, a few people to suicide. And doing my own EMDR, when I was being trained in EMDR, I had no idea how much was locked in there I thought my what I, my little disturbance was because we were training and you had to think of a recent disturbance. Okay, here's this little disturbance. I'm thinking it had something to do with high school or something. Oh no. But the, the protocol of EMDR goes to the heart. It's actually the wisdom of your own brain. Because we sitting here, like we could talk forever, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. Okay, that kind of, all right. And then you go off and then you get activated again. It doesn't allow the brain to really heal. The wisdom of, of our own brain doing EMDR allows it to make the connections it needs to go to. So when our brain shuts stuff down for our own protection, it, we can't access it, but then it'll get triggered and it'll light up and it'll cause things like what, what happened to Stacy to happen. But the horror of it, I had no idea how much horror and terror I was holding. And we, like sometimes we actually see the trauma, but sometimes just knowing about the trauma, this is how our human minds cope. We, whoop, we, we have an image in our mind whether it's real or not, we hold that image there and it has such power to, to throw us around on our nervous system in an in a unhelpful way. Um, so going through the process of EMDR, for me, in it, it took me by surprise because I literally started shaking, which now I know with the, the nervous system that's good. When, when we shake, like if somebody falls, you're supposed to be present with them and don't, unless there's traffic or whatever, don't make somebody pop right up. Be present with them, let them shake, let them discharge, let their nervous system do its thing before, don't talk to them too much, let them get it out. So I literally was shaking, discharging along the, the horror of what was in my own mind that I didn't even know was in my mind. So um, EMDR, I can attest to, it's very powerful. So you went from that kind of, like, what the heck, came to me, didn't understand, like, why, but then with that protocol, you're able to go, okay, there's a reason for this. We flow back to the original trauma, and all of this is done super titrated, carefully, like we had to do today, we're, we're not gonna just jump right in. We, we, we don't wanna blow up the system. It's done very carefully, methodically, intuitively, watching the person, everyone's different. But we were able to get back to the, the original trauma. And then I don't know, maybe two sessions of EMDR? Do you remember what Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the wisdom of Stacy's own mind went to where it needed to go and came to a place of resolution. Like, I know. Do you remember what your your positive cognition was at the end? I don't remember yesterday. You remember today? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but like something along the lines of it. It it's it's usually about yourself. Like I I did everything I could or I'm safe or yeah, something along those lines. Anything uh, you'd like to add that you would like people to know? I have questions.
Okay. Okay. And just for the sake of time, um, we're not going to really have interactive, um, but we afterwards, if you have questions, we have cards we'd like you to write them on, and then we're going to actually do a, a video to answer more in-depth questions. So, um, thank you. Thank you. Um, one, let's see, I put my on. Okay. So, uh, I, I talked to another uh, lovely woman that uh, I work with, and she uh, is a mom and lost her son to suicide. And was she, I asked her, is there anything you, she couldn't come tonight for the work, um, but I, I asked her, is there anything you'd like people to know? Um, what was helpful for you, what wasn't? And she had lots to say. <laughs> she said, what's really horrible is how people met after her son had died, people avoided her like the plague, she said. Like, that was terrible. People, that was very painful that people just avoided her. Um, and then the people, some people, that, that didn't avoid, they would ask really intrusive questions or kind of engaging in the rumor mill. Like, I heard this happen, is this, and it, it was like so insensitive, but she got a lot of that which is pretty horrifying in itself. So don't do that. <laughs> don't ask detailed questions or don't ask about rumor mill questions. Um, what was really helpful, uh, th this one just, one of her friends asked her, che so checking in, ju just knowing that people were there, just checking in, not right away, I mean, given her space, but then over time, they just kept checking in. I'm thinking of you. Do you need anything? I'm here for you. Back when we could hug and not care about hugs because of COVID, people would just give her a hug, no words even, just a hug. And she said that was so helpful. And one of her friends um, texted her, are, are you working? Yeah. What, what time are you done? And she told her, and when she got home, there was a warm meal hanging on her door. So that, that just crushes me, because it, it's just so sweet. It's, it's so ventral bagel. So do things like that. <laughs> okay. Here's, here's the last thing that, that she said to do, and um, so often I think people avoid, because they don't know what to say. But what was really helpful for her it was telling the good stories, tell the good memories, things she didn't even know about. People would come up to her and say, oh my gosh, your son helped me so much. He, he talked to me right from his heart. Or funny stories about what he had done throughout his life. He was a young man when he died, but even childhood stories. She said, don't be afraid of you know, upsetting me by telling me these stories. I want to hear those stories. I'm thinking about them all the time. So to hear how he touched other people's lives was really, really helpful for her. And yeah, don't blame yourself. So easier said than done. And EMDR can help with that if, if we have the trauma locked in, like it's my fault. We can tell ourselves that all day, but unless you allow your brain to really heal, it, it sticks, and EMDR can be very helpful with not blaming yourself. Okay, we're almost ready for break, but I, let's turn the lights down if you don't mind. I want to teach one more skill for calming the nervous system, helping us self-regulate, and you guys can probably see me. I'm like regulating myself over here. Because like if I wasn't in front of you all, I'd probably cry a little more. And I'm like, no, we, we got to pendulate back. So I use that word a lot, pendulating. Let's calm back down. 
So we might get a little emotional, a little sad, or touched. And then, okay, let's pendulate back to calm. So like, like I'm kind of naturally doing, looking around. And here's another one, it's called butterfly hug. And there's something, and actually I, I learned more about it, why bilateral stimulation is so calming and helpful. It's because when we're traumatized, if they've done brain scans, and one part of the brain on one side gets very lit up, and a non-traumatized brain doesn't have all that activity. So the bilateral helps to kind of even out that blood flow. I was like, what? I wonder, like I love to, to run or paddle, or I love all these back and forth things. Well, no wonder, it, it's very soothing. So what I'd like you guys to do is, it's, I'll show you, it's hard to talk and hold the microphone and do it at the same time. But it's like this. So very gentle and slow, you're just gently tapping on alternating shoulders. You can close your eyes if you want. You can do a little gazing too if you want. A little gentle butterfly, and it's a very kind, compassionate move for yourself. It's hard to be really mad at that exiled part when you're you're doing a nice little butterfly hug. And Here's a little tip too, like if you're in a doctor's office or you're in a waiting room and you don't want people seeing you butterfly hug, you can just try alternating gentle foot taps, just back and forth, kind of aware of it. That's why I, I like to swing, I, you know, when I do my virtual sessions, I'm in my little rock and chair. Those things are really soothing to our nervous system. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to have a segment on self-care. So I'll let Mackenzie and Maddie come on up. examples of self-care. So we have a bunch of these little handouts over on the other side on the table. So when you take our break or when you're getting ready to leave, feel free to take these with you. Um, some examples of self-care include meditation, yoga, uh, physical activity like running or working out, journaling, many things. Uh, for me, I've been doing yoga recently. It really just engages the whole system and it's very soothing for me. Um, but that might look different for you or for Kenzie or anybody. So you just really have to find what helps you. And personally for me, I'm a pretty active person. So I find cheerleading as my form of self-care. Also, I do like meditation a lot. Like Maddie said, it's very relaxing and it's a good way to really just decompress. And going into a part of self-care is taking breaks. And over on our back table, we have snacks and water. And then, like Maddie said, we have a bunch of handouts and bracelets. So feel free. Yeah, we'll take like five minutes or so.
Five? Okay, great. So as everybody's making their way back to their seat, I uh, another person wanted me to share this about um, how EMDR has helped her, uh, just that it gave her tremendous freedom. She also experienced a suicide of somebody that, that she was working closely with. And uh, I'll just read what she wrote here. I can't express how much EMDR has helped me in dealing with the loss and trauma that was the result of experiencing a loss of a wonderful person to suicide. The intrusive thoughts, images, and nightmares were intense and caused a trickle-down effect on every area of my life. EMDR has stopped the images and intrusive thoughts which occurred on a daily basis. I can't explain it, but it also saved me from the intense feeling and thought that the person I lost was suffering to actually seeing them being set free. I am beyond grateful for this because now I too can move forward. I'm no longer suffering and have found great peace. For this I am thankful and know my family is as well because she was able to be present with her family much better. And the thing with it, because this is another person that I'd worked with and we still work together, but when these things bubble up, it might take one, I think with this particular incident that she's referring to here, I think uh, we had one EMDR session. So that's how impactful EMDR can be for certain incident, incidents. Um, for long-term complex trauma that has been ongoing, it, it doesn't clear up as quickly um, like it does for a specific one trauma, um, but it still can, can really be helpful and uh, increase healing. So um, now we're going to shift gears from uh, people that have lost loved ones to suicide to talking with, um, we can have Taylor come up here in a second, but uh, struggling, active struggling now. What, what to do now if you are feeling suicidal or a loved one is feeling that way, let, let's have some conversations about that. So come on up, Taylor. Again, I really appreciate your willingness to uh, be here and to share about your experience. So thank you so much. My pleasure. <laughs> um, you and I, let's see, I had, to, I had to go back in the record and, and look. We've been working together for three years. And um, the first year was like building trust, getting to know each other. I was doing a lot of like the, the front loading of the skills and things like that. And about a year into our work and two years ago, you were going through a really rough time in your life. So if you feel comfortable, you want to share a bit about what was going on or what you were experiencing at that time initially. Well, to start off, um, I went through therapy my whole entire life since I was about six years old. And it, it took a long road to go through different therapists to find what fit me properly. So I think that's really important to find someone that you connect with. I'm gonna use that word a lot, connecting. Um, once I got through it and we developed the trust, um, I was able to, to move forward and go through with therapy with, with Hal. And we also have done EMDR, and I can tell you that it, it, it works wonders. We've only done it about maybe two or three times. And this was separate to the suicide thing entirely, but it has worked wonders. Um, what else do you want to talk about? Do you want to talk about like, the, when you started feeling suicide? So um, I got to a certain point in my life where um, things started to go downhill. Um, I'd eventually become homeless, and it's hard because 
you would think in your life, like you have thoughts of suicide, but sometimes your your societal or environmental things play into a that part of being suicidal. And I felt like I had no options left. And I felt like I had no hope left. And it took me a really long time to, to gain the courage to talk to someone at all about that because I stayed silent for so long. And I decided to speak with Cal because we had developed that trust and we had spoken to each other. And then we moved forward with what we could do about it. Yeah, and you and I worked as a team big time through this process. And uh, one thing that Tina's uh, talking about, the, the Craig Bryan, uh, where he, he mentions in his Rethinking Suicide training that when you're working for an agency, and, and we're mandated reporters, like often it's like, People don't want to say anything for fear of, okay, you're going to a hospital, you know, the, and, and don't get me wrong, sometimes hospitalization is needed, but let's slow the roll and, and find out what's going on. Let's not just throw the panic button right away. Let's um, problem solve together. And I think that's what you and I did as, as a team. And maybe it would be helpful for people listening, what were the components of the process? Because obviously, you're a success story. Because you're here you are doing really well two years later, and you were I was terrified for you a lot of the time. Um, and thank God you're OK. Uh, so maybe it would be helpful to know, OK, how? How did you go from being that low, and it was a step-by-step -step thing, huh? So how, how, how'd we do it, Taylor? All right, guys, this is a big one. Are you ready? Um, so I started talking about Cal, or talking to Cal, I should say. And I was like, what, what do I do? I'm starting to have these feelings. Like, please don't throw me in the brig real quick. And she was like, OK. She just got down and it was like, let's have a, a whole idea. We're gonna we're gonna step by step process. We work together to create a plan, and it's not end all be all. So so often when you're feeling suicidal, when you get to that point, you're you're at the end of your line, and that's what I felt like. I was at the end of my line. I had nothing else to do. Did I want to kill myself? Yes and no. Because obviously you want to be alive, but my body, my system was shutting down. You get into the, like, the, the dorsal vagals the point. So when we started talking more, she was like, no, we have options. There are more options for you. You can do more. And we started talking about like um, people we can speak to. There are options. There are links, whatever. She was like, you know, if you, if you feel like you need to be hospitalized or whatever, we can do that. And it got to the point where I did end up going into hospitalization for three days. But she went through and made all of the, she went through and talked about, or went to talk, to talk to people like elsewhere to find out which was the right place to go, who was safe, who wasn't. And I felt, I felt safe. I felt secure with her because I trusted her. And that really made a huge difference. So that the the calling ahead, uh, yes. making the connections yeah. to the hospitals, who has beds, paving the way, and it, it did take trust because you agreed to go, but not that minute. And I use the term a lot: eggs in the basket. We, we need plenty of eggs in our baskets. We need support. And, and you had some people that you were talking to, and I, I believed you and trusted you that you were talking to supportive people and knowing. And one of the things, this very facility, we had a big group, um, another, uh, a therapy group, and, and Taylor was part of that group, and she shared at the end of the group, okay, guys, it went.
so part of the group, we were here. We were actually, um, weren't we on the, I think we were on the other side. So we were over in that area. But um, part of what Cal kept telling me was, it's good to talk to people. Talk to people you trust in. Speak to people, like make it, don't, don't just like shout out on the rooftops, hey, I'm suicidal. No, but, but speak to people that you, that you trust in and the more you talk about it, the easier it becomes to alleviate that pain. And I had gone through it for, cause I know we, we do, we would do groups like what, every month, once a month or so. So um, our new group was coming up and there were a lot of people there that I sincerely care about. A couple of them are in this group right now and I still sincerely care about them. And I was like, you know what? She said it was a good idea. I don't know how to feel about it, but I'm just gonna try it. I just put the faith in Cal, and I was like, all right, let's try it. So I spoke to a few of my friends and then said it in the group, and I was like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm getting ready to go in the psych ward. I'm gonna go in for suicide. And just, just to let them know that like, this is my decision to make myself more healthy or try to make a step towards a better change or something. How did it feel once you shared? Oh God, okay, how did it feel once I shared? Um, it was so nerve wracking, kind of what I'm feeling right about now. Um, I almost didn't say it in group. I remember it coming around to my turn to speak and I, I just choked up. And then finally I just spat it out, kind of like word vomit. And once I got it out, I felt a little bit better, but I felt awfully embarrassed. But then I had a lot of really good comeback from people coming up to me after a group, like, thank you so much for sharing. We're really proud of you. Like, yada, yada, like just support. And I realized that it was worth it because of the connectivity that you had with people. Just like throwing yourself out there sometimes is not as bad as we might think it is. As long as it's, I suppose, done in a simple way. But, like, just getting it out there, and it, it really, I felt much more relieved afterwards. And although problems weren't resolved, that was another step towards success. Yeah, so the, the ventral vagal, Taylor's making some, some highlights where having people in your life or finding people that you trust causes us to feel more connected and we're not all alone. And, and that's a, as far as if therapists are watching, um, if you can create some groups. The groups that I've done, even though I'm in private practice, the groups are what really connect, blows it up. Because you can talk to me every week, just me, and you think, well, she's being nice because she's a therapist and she has to, you know. But when you come into a group, of other people that are safe, and I, I, that's paramount to me. We're not just gonna have a, a group with, there's, there's structure, there's rules, and, and people that are, I, I knew would be a good mix. Man, it just, it, it just blows it right up to that connection. Eventually, like years, the, the connection keeps going. And that we can do that. That's what we're doing tonight. We can find our people. We can find our people. And that was so important, I think. And everybody was super proud of you. Um, let's let's go in reverse a little bit. Because even when, when Taylor and I were talking about doing this together, um, it, it, it's still, it's amazing how with trauma, there's a blind spot sometimes. And, and you were kind of like, well, it was because of life situations. That's why. And I'm like, eh, girl. And the trauma, because in your being homeless, you were the, the things that you had to do that were resources for you, they were super triggering, and they were bringing up trauma. So I don't want you to get into all your trauma, but the way you describe some of your sensations, um, I, think are, I think a lot of people could relate to and learn from. So she's speaking not of just my 
situational trauma, I also have past trauma, which will add on to that. Um, so the, the moment that I was in being homeless, I was stressed about that, of course, but I also had an equal amount of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder coming up through that. And um, with that being said, the feeling, we, we've talked about the feeling that we're going for right now. Yeah, so the, it, it's taken me years to describe this because like I said, I've been in therapy for years and I've been pre-suicidal when I was younger and I couldn't, I couldn't describe it. And the best way to talk about it right now is that you feel like you're trapped in a box with water rising and it's, it's, it's up to your neck, you know, like above your shoulders, up to your neck, up to your, your chin. And finally, you can barely take your last gas with air. And that's the feeling of being suicidal. How old were you in the first time? The first time that I felt that way was when I was nine years old. And I started self-harming during that time. But that was in order to inebriate the stress. That was not necessarily a suicidal thing. But that caused, like, it was help, helping alleviate it at the same time. But it was just, it's, it's, it's like a vicious cycle. We're trying to get rid of it, but it's perpetuating at the same time. So, kind of summarizing here, your, your safety plan, bringing in other people, paving a path to make sure you had a, a safe facility to go to because you and I, I didn't feel comfortable with you not getting stabilized. Um, I knew that it was beyond just you and I were doing stabilization until you could get to the hospital. And I was keeping real close contact with Taylor. I was calling her a lot. Hey, uh, we went to a horse barn, <laughs> a therapeutic horse barn, like, um, I, and I was trying to help you make more connections. Um, and I know you were working with your horse at that time, kind of a, a, a connector kind of thing. Um, and then once you got to the hospital, I know medications was something you wanted to mention because that was a game changer and it, it, it wasn't easy coming for you. So throughout my life, with uh, being in therapy and whatnot, I've been on antidepressants on and off for quite a while. And um, I realized that they weren't working out for me. And I decided to take myself off them gently. And I, this is what kind of built up to my suicidal feelings. And I couldn't figure out like, what's wrong? Like, I know I have a history of depression and anxiety, but like, what, what's causing all of this, these problems. And then um, once I got into the psych ward, I was only in there for three days, but I, I spoke to a professional psychiatrist and they finally decided to put me on a set of medication that works specifically with not only like my mental illnesses but also with what I was going through and it turned my whole life around and at that point when you're in the mental health ward you can't say no so I was just there at my own will but it changed it so that I could I could live a whole different life and now I, I depend on those things like they if I had missed something a day like I would have an awful day so certain, certain times they do really help for people, but it, it just depends on the person and everyone's different. So that's the thing, like, yeah, I mean, you could ask me what I'm on, but that's not gonna help for any specific person because it, it really depends on and who you are and what you're going through. But um, it really pays to find someone that you can trust to speak to about that thing. The medications you weren't a huge fan before because you hadn't found them to be very helpful and sometimes you had bad reactions to them but then once you were in a, a safe controlled environment with a psychiatrist that could monitor you closely 
and then it started to really make a huge difference and now you're ongoing with them yes. and if they're interrupted you can feel it so for you meds have been a huge game changer yes. and it, like taylor said it's not that way for everybody and everybody's so different this complex issue again um, but, but so thankful that that it is helpful um, this eye on the clock here, uh, the reactions of people. So it might be helpful for people listening. What kind of reactions or things that people said were cringy, very unhelpful, and, and what, what were the real solid uh, supportive reactions like? So... Part of what I was going through was Cal was like, you know, maybe you should talk to people about what you're going through. And again, I definitely agree with this. However, you're not going to get the same reaction from everyone. You have to expect that. Um, some people are like, I would never do that. Or I, I couldn't believe you'd feel that way with all you've got going for you. Um, a lot of friends actually said, I have no idea that you would be like this. Like, you don't seem like you're suicidal at all. And a few friends were like, you know, kind of downputting, like, oh, you know, you can do better. Like, like you, you don't deserve to feel this way, you know? And all of those things were a little bit disheartening, but I had to remember to expect, you know, differentiation, but um some of the things that i found that are helpful are like just just listening to people listen to their story let them talk um and when i provide feedback it's usually like a little bit in relationship but like just to give positive affirmation towards someone no matter what they're going through or to offer help or offer an ear or any sort of support. I don't, I don't think it's good to just give your immediate commentary back, per se. You mentioned, like, sometimes people mean well, they make it about themselves. Yeah, so a lot of people that I've spoken to, they met really well, um, but unfortunately they've, they've kind of just spoken about themselves instead of so they turn it on themselves. And that's not necessarily helpful either. But I, I don't feel poorly towards them, but unfortunately that, that happens with a lot of people, depending on who they are. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for all your, your information. Is there, we, we talked about the therapeutic relationship. Um, so to somebody that's struggling, what, what would you want them to know about how therapy might be helpful and, and how to uh, have good boundaries with therapists. <laughs> okay, so I just spoke with a friend the other day that was talking about getting a new therapist and they've been going through therapists and they weren't sure who to go to, they didn't know who was going to connect with them and because of Miss Cal over here, I've learned to create boundaries, wow. And I think the, the best thing is is to go to a therapist and be able to tell them, as soon as you go, they usually push paperwork in your face, you know, sign all these documents, we're gonna get it in, and I'm like, no, why don't we have a first meeting and just speak, like get to know each other, and like you, you have to create boundaries to let them know, like, I might not be going to you, initially I just want to be able to see who you are and figure you out and see if this works as a relationship and I think that that's really intense that nobody ever realizes and, and I as a child like my whole life I've never done that I've just gone straight into a, like a therapist and just been with them for however long and I'm like why didn't I think of this before so I think it, it, it's really healthy because they're a professional too they have to respect that um, also, what else are we talking about? Um, um, like, what, what therapy is helpful? What do you think that's helpful? So, 
as far as like helpful perspectives for someone who's going through something like this, like we've talked about listening, and I think through therapy, um, it's really, I, I can't describe the feeling, it's utterly incredible to be able to get around a therapist who can take the time to understand you and listen to you fully and create that um, relationship where they can let you know certain tools or certain things or like understanding boundaries. Like if I, if I had not gone through this with Cal, I don't know if I'd still be alive today because I, I was provided with the tools to work through what I was going through. I didn't previously have those, even though going through the therapy my whole life. So I think it, it's really crucial to go through that and create a relationship with your therapist, for sure. Thank you. You did great. Yeah. And uh, Tino, would you like to come on up? And Okay. I'm going to sit so I don't trip because I'm prone to that. So just given the time right now, I'm going to kind of sum up what I was going to talk about. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, Taylor kind of helped us out with the segue here, you know, by ending her piece talking about what is important when you are seeking, you know, help um, and, you know, trying to find somebody. Um, for therapy because in you know in our in our in our clinics you know I think that um, there are a lot of papers that are kind of shoved at people when they first come in you know we have a time frame that we have to hit you know and, and get all this information in but my approach you know is, is I like to sit with that person you know, and kind of find out what's going on with them before we, you know, all of those other things are very important, you know, but let's find out what's going on in the moment, right? So when we first talked about um, that PESI training by Craig Bryan, um, and he was talking about how to, uh, you know, rethink, um, you know, how, how, we, how we handle this, how do we treat this, how do we approach this? And the main thing that he really focused on was allowing people to share their own narrative. And part of sharing their own narrative is, you know, as, as a therapist, is, is being on the side um, where you're present. You're present, you're holding space, um, and you're allowing that person to share what's going um, on with them, what they've been through at their own pace. You know, there's a lot of questions on assessments that we have to go through, but I think that if you can be present, and, and even, even if you're not a therapist, if you're a friend, a family member, a teacher, you know, anybody that is going through crisis, um, the most important thing is being present. And being present is basically focusing on what's going on in the moment, right? And holding space is, you know, being in tune with what's going on in the moment with the other person without judgment, right? Um, you're listening. And um, I actually looked up, because I wanted to find a, a specific def definition, um, and it says, of course, being present with someone without judgment, and then it gave this quotation, and I liked it. It means you donate your ears and your heart without wanting anything in return. And by doing that, you're practicing empathy and compassion. You're being with that person in that moment. Um, so I just want to just real quick give a couple, a couple tips on how you can be more present. Some of these things are things you guys have heard before. You may know already. But listening. Listening and not just hearing what the person is saying. You know, um, when we're listening, we are choosing to black out distractions you know whether that distractions of our own thoughts distractions that are happening around us and our surroundings um, 
you know, uh, we also focus specifically on the person. You know, we, we make eye contact with them. We let them know through our body language, hey, we're here, we're present, we're with you. Um, you know, we ask questions like, tell me more about that. You know, help me understand those things. You know, we're, we're not looking to um, pass any judgment. And what I kept saying in this article over and over and over again, put your phones away. <laughs> That's very important, you know, because especially, you know, when we are so busy in our lives, you know, we're thinking about the next thing that we have to do, and we have to pick up our, you know, our, 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 our kid at this time at practice, we have to go to the store, we have to do it. The best thing that we can do for one another is to just be, right? Um, hold on. I mentioned body language. Something also that just came up um, with, with Cal and Taylor was, you know, talking about not having to interject with, well, this is how I can relate, or this is my story, or this is my background, because it's not about us in those moments. It's about holding space for that other person. And we don't need to come up with responses. We just need to be present, okay? Um, and then another little quote from, from that article said, be interested, not interesting. So, it, it kind of tells you where that shift should be, right? Um, also, it says um, in here to not multitask because we're not good at it. <laughs> we're not good at it. And when we're trying to do two things at once, there's just always something that's lacking. And when somebody is struggling or in crisis, you want to make sure that you're giving your full attention. You want to be able to show that empathy and that compassion. And that, and the last thing, of course, is be mindful. You know, and mindfulness is being self-aware. You know, being aware um, of where your focus is in that conversation, you know, um, and, and keeping it on how you can help that, that individual. So Craig Bryan in the long and short was just saying, let's focus on the narrative and what's going on with somebody in crisis what happened from point A to point B? Instead of just going through the assessment of questions that ask, you know, are you suicidal? You know, how, you know, or do you just do you self harm? You, there's other ways to ask those questions, you know, and sometimes just getting to know your person and knowing, um, you know, where they struggle, you know, knowing what overwhelms them. Um, you know, what their triggers may be. There, there's a different approach. It's a, it's a more trauma-informed approach, I think. That, that's my take on it. You know, being present. And of course, you know, we have to gather that information too, but it's, there's a way. There's a way that you can do that. Um, and I think the best way that you can show someone that you care is to be present, regardless of their situation, you know? So... That's kind of my little wrap on, on that, because I know we're pressed for time. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll post some, some, some things, some links and stuff, so you have that information you know, with Craig Bryan and all that, if you, you're interested in, in looking at that. And you know, if you have any other questions or anything like that, we will, we will answer um, in a video following. So yeah, so I think um, that pretty much concludes what we're doing. I'm going to hand this back over to Cal. Thanks, Tina. Great information. And those concepts you were talking about, like being present, coming alongside somebody, in terms of the nervous system, that's called co-regulation. It's like if somebody's all in their nervous system right here, and you come along a calm person, that can be really contagious. Just like it can go the other way. We can sign right on and get all Twitter paid to, or we could co-regulate. I, I love those things that, that you found and shared. So we have a questionnaire um, on evaluation for those of you that have attended. Please fill it out, or there's one on our Instagram account, right? So if you go to the Become Forum Instagram, you can also do it online or just do it there. We have three by five cards for questions and a basket. If you have further questions about any of the content 
or other things you want to hear more of, please let us know. And we'll keep doing this kind of thing if there's an interest and a, you know, if more people, less people even, we, we're willing. We're, we're here showing up and we're so thankful that you all showed up. And uh, great job, you guys. Thanks for coming. Thank you.